Matitei Delgado, acolo este o batit corner, dragi ascultători. De... I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Anyway, welcome back to Valverde Broadcasting. I'm Duncan Casey. This is Toby Venables. I forgot to put on my tweed jacket that I brought because I wanted to appear somewhat professorial compared to the great man himself. But there we are. Thank Doesn't you. matter. Today we're going to get into a kind of special topic, uh, a broader topic, talking about is horror scary anymore? And obviously within that, kind of what makes horror scary or what has made horror scary. Um, and obviously the sort of subjective nature thereof. Um, should we start, do you think, Toby, at kind of the beginning of horror? Like, what, what would you say was the kind of... What's the first horror film? Is it <laughs> Nosferatu? Well, uh, yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I mean, the whole term horror, the, as a genre, it, it doesn't really happen until the 1930s. And certainly the term horror comes out of the Universal Monsters series in the, in the 1930s. But um, obviously in storytelling terms, there were stories of monsters and vampires and ghouls and heaven knows what uh, for, forever, mm. really. But Nosferatu was, was the first one that we would look at now and say, pretty much definitely a horror film and a, a, a pirated version of uh, Dracula. So they nicked, they just nicked Dracula. <laughs> and said, no one will notice. But just change all the names, it'll be fine. And it wasn't fine. And uh, Bram, <laughs> Bram Stoker's... <laughs> Bram Stoker's <Oi. laughs> yeah, Bram Stoker's widow was like Count Orlock, mm. yes. and basically uh, there was legal action, and they had all uh, they were supposed to destroy all all prints of the film. Oh, really? Yeah. And so it's only by chance that we have that film, right? Uh, okay. So, which is, so it's quite an interesting uh, sort of beginning for horror cinema. And horror seems to me to have straddled kind of, there's, there's your cheap horror, which there's yep. plenty of, and I've been in plenty of it as well. <laughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's You're great in it now. <laughs> I'm in it now. Um, and uh, shot very much like this. Um, yeah, but this is better, sorry, Richard. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and that's where a lot of your kind of conceptual stuff, you know, your, your high concept stuff comes from. But then you've also yeah. got the kind of high art horror, and then there doesn't seem to be much middle ground stuff, but kind of, Jump like I, because there's all the kind of Vincent Pricey stuff as well. The <laughs> Doctor Fibes, you know the yeah. thing where he was in the basement. Then you saw, you know, and he, like, yeah. have you seen that? The, the, was it yes. the abominable Doctor Fibes? Yes, yes. My, my my friend Stephen Mosley, shout out to him who I haven't seen for a long time. He played the Goblin in a film called Kenneth. <laughs> I did years ago, um, nine years ago, quirky, uh, is well into all this stuff. And he brought along those kind of things and he brought all the black black exploitation stuff because we were living in a house together while we shot it. So we'd watch all these like black killer yeah. and, uh, and yeah, all yeah, this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. It was a education for me. So, um, but yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, I, we're jumping probably a few decades on from. Yeah, Nosferatu. well, I mean, it, I suppose the thing is, and the thing with Nosferatu and all the Universal Monsters that is that it, it has this literary kind of basis at right. the start. And so it's, it's all, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the mummy sort of, um, um, they're, they're all kind of like drawing on uh, novels, and uh, usually 19th century novels. Um, but it kind of, uh, w the other thing about that that's, that's kind of interesting is, is the fact that the, this is Hollywood output in the, in the 30s, 30s and 40s. And yet none of it, none of those horror movies made by, mostly by Universal, but some, some others as well. Um, none of those Hollywood horror movies are set in America. Right. And there's a point at which um, American horror arrives and exists. <laughs> it's arriving um, right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could go out Quite to the airstrip draw. and welcome it. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but at that point, it's all old world stuff, and like, the source of horror is the old world. Yeah. Uh, but then you kind of get um, in the fifties, you get all this sort of creature features, and you know, uh, giant ants coming out of the desert, and like literally coming out of the the ground of yeah. America yeah, yeah. because of things that Americans have done to their own land, you know, irradiating it. So there's a fear of radiation and the bomb and and also you, you get all those flying saucer movies, which are fantastic, obviously. Mm. Um, and then you get Psycho. Right. Where it's like this amazing, it's like this this kind of p 
pivot point in 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 cinema really where this it you know sometimes things happen in films that are like uh, uh, amazing moments in that film and sometimes things happen in, in films that are so significant that they actually seem to sort of change cinema like the first appearance of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park or something like that and that moment when um, uh, Janet Lee is killed yeah. in Psycho, which is a long way into the film, and it, at, at which point you invested in, in this character and you're totally going along with, okay, she's our, she's our character, this is what the story is. It kind of seems like film noir because it's like this sort of sweaty, claustrophobic city and she's a femme fatale and she's blonde and she's stealing some money and it's all got a sort of noirish kind of setup. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit sleazy because she's, you know, she, it starts with her in a hotel room with her, her sort of boyfriend. Um, and then she goes off the road in, in, in the rain to find a motel, ends up at the Bates Motel, and it's, it's game over for her and game over for the genre. And it switches to a completely new genre, completely unexpectedly. The, her body and the bunny goes in the pond and we never see or hear of it again because it's irrelevant and it becomes a new genre, which is this American horror genre. And not only that, it becomes a genre that hasn't even been invented yet, because it's yeah. basically a slasher movie. Yeah, right. And you don't really get slasher movies until way later. So right. that's my just little bit of spiel about no, Psycho, no. where it's cut. And that's, that's where you're starting to get a real homegrown American horror that's sort of grounded in reality, because the whole Ed Gein Thing had happened in 1957, which is like three years before, mm. and Robert Block wrote a book about that, sort of loosely based on that. So I wrote the book Psycho, upon which the film was based. Um, and the Ed Gein case, you know, really kind of shocked America because yeah. it was real and he was doing terrible things, which kind of influenced horror f forever after. Yeah, you know, it's in it's in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's in Silence of the Lambs, like. His grave robbing and making, you know, masks out of Buffalo faces. <laughs> yeah. well, there's, All of that stuff. There's, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's. Uh, no, I don't want to segue into talking about this because it's such. A no, go on. Segue. But the kind of the kind of the the, the cross dressing element of Psycho, and then later on yeah. the kind of transgender stuff that's in uh, Silence of the Lambs and all yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing. There's a sort of I don't know if it's written from the point of view of fearing that I suppose it is. I mean, you got in the in the the killer is that, and is it? But Trans, it's yeah, transgression, more, transgression yeah, more, of one kind, maybe equals transgression of another. Right, and also the kind of idea of self-loathing getting to the point where you literally hate so much about yourself fundamentally that you have to change and like a butterfly in the case yeah, of, yeah, of yeah. silence. But um, you know, there's that all that thing of metamorphosis and change and and what what are you and is it you know there's what makes you human. I mean, I suppose it, it, it is. I, a psycho must be one of the early things at the jumping off point of like. And as you say, um, influenced by Again, is like it's confronting the things about ourselves, our deepest, darkest, whatever's. It's going yeah. in rather than out, right? The ex existential kind of stuff of um, aliens and monsters and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Being afraid, and I guess, and that's a wartime thing as well, and kind of the reds under the bed stuff, and you know, all the foreign land kind of thing, you know, and uh, other culture. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now, now it's more about now. Hang on, who are we? And what this is fundamentally? What are we at our core? And um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And I, th I mean, for in America, I think it comes at a point where America's just sort of kind of forging its it, it, an identity. Right. A more specific, and, it, and it's just interesting to me that it starts like horror in America in Hollywood starts with all old world stuff, all old world, totally, mm. and and then just and gradually shifts, and it, it coincides with the the decline of the Western as well, like the Western right. which mythologizes you know the, uh, the American landscape, and presents it as this land of opportunity and plenty and yeah you know danger as well, but sort of challenges that kind of make you you know, that make you a man, you know, right. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that, that declines in the 50s, really. And But in the 50s is, is exactly when you see basically exactly the same landscape, you know, that you see in the Westerns uh, being the backdrop of, you know, nuclear testing, giant ants, uh, alien <laughs> invasions, uh, it's sort of land, aliens landing in the desert. It's the desert and it's the, yeah. it's the landscape of the Western. And it's like, hang on. 
the, the landscape started, something's, something's gone a bit awry here. Mm. And the American dream of, you know, what was promised in, in the Western has started to go a bit is it guilt wrong? Because well? there's, the, there's the whole Indian burial ground thing. We built on this, and the, like the new king of I the land. I think it's really. I, I, is it? I think it's really, really well. I don't know. I think it's really complicated. I think it's really complicated. Well, having big, having big... kind of fought, I suppose, a world war on the basis of we're the good guys. I suppose after that, having won as a culture, do you you must? They, I, I don't know, but I suppose you sit around and kind of go, were we the good guys? Like, I mean, <laughs> obviously we were. You know, ultimately yes, but there's got to be a lot of questioning of that identity and the, hang on if we examine yeah. our past we weren't always great and we we conquered this land and nuked it and all this sort of stuff so maybe the land will come out and get us like like with poltergeist or like yeah you know. and i think there's there's like politically like um before before the second world war and certainly towards the end of the first world war like the united states was very separate and was very consciously separating itself and it's like doing its own thing uh, from the old world <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, America. Oh, fuck um, yourself, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, th these views are not necessarily my own, um, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but it was, it was you know separ separatist kind of um, uh, kind of ethos, and then coming back to to Europe in a major major type way in like World War Two, where it's like okay, we can't we can't be separate. Um, and, and coming out of that conflict being like a major world uh, power mm. and, and, and looked at as a major world power by, by the world, then it's like you start trying to you start thinking about what you are and what you should be and maybe it's a bit kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe it, it, there's some anxieties that emerge there as well. So I'm seeing it in Freudian terms. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyway. So in terms of, so obviously coming back to our kind of main, th so we've got that kind of. Sorry, thing. yeah, bring it. No, back not to at me. all. No, no. Um, no, it's all good stuff. So the, so the, so the, the kind of was that period. I mean, it's it's hard. Obviously, it's t entirely subjective as to what scares you. But I think that in hindsight, with the dun dun da Ant Man, <laughs> Dr. Fags, and all that stuff, that all yeah. that, it doesn't scare me at all. But. I, I don't know if that's because I've grown up. I'm sort of everyone's kind of sin illiterate now, so the, 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 like you know, oh, it's some bughead that, or the original <laughs> Fly with David Hedison, you know that that kind of stuff is not particularly scary. The subject matter might be if you really sat and dwelled on it and, and that yeah. kind of thing. And, um, but the, so kind of going into, I mean, the sixties and seventies were they they were terror. I mean, seventies maybe more so. But the, I mean, was there a lot of horror kind of going on then? I mean, I'm showing my lack of knowledge there, but I don't. Uh, yeah. There was, I mean, I suppose the thing that happens, the thing that happens, another thing that happens in the 50s, which is quite significant, is that the studio system mm. where um, like the main uh, Hollywood studios owned like all of, the, all of the cinemas, so it was like complete control over distribution. And that was seen as sort of too much of a horrible monopoly, which the United States you know, traditionally doesn't like that kind of business operation. So they they uh, broke up the, the studio system. And it meant then that independent filmmakers could actually, you know, you could just go out and make a film and possibly get it shown in a few cinemas and maybe get distribution. Mm. And that's why you get, in the 50s and certainly into the 60s, suddenly loads of people making independent films. Like, you know, like Night, Night of the Living Dead. That's right, why that's yeah. able to happen. And then, and there's also a new audience, which is teenagers. Mm. Um, and in America, they they because things are pretty good economically for the most part. Um, those kids have got jobs and they got money and they got cars because they're manufacturing like crazy. So you know they're they're a, a brand new audience yeah. for um, and so you get drive-ins and you get a certain kind of movie yeah. that you know date movies where um, you know there are different. <laughs> That you get, you take your girlfriend there, and she gets frightened and clings to you, and yeah, yeah. you know it's all, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, So yeah. that's that. But uh, so there's that, and that's really the big change, and that, and that you get that, um, yeah. So sort of like Night of the Living Dead is is a really good example where it's it's like there's there's just no way that could have come out of a Hollywood studio. Mm. Mm. But in the '60s, you know, you're getting a lot of stuff like that that's happening, kind of at the edges of. Hollywood, which is still churning forward, doing its thing, and of course you got Hammer and stuff in in Britain, which is a big, campy, exaggerated gothicness. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I mean, because like we then at some point we transitioned into the kind of more gruey. I suppose you had slasher stuff. Um, you had your Halloween and your little, you know, all this kind of thing. But it, um, it's the, the sort of transition into the kind of the video nasty stuff, I suppose. I mean, like yeah. Exorcist and all that kind of thing. I mean, is that? Yeah, yeah. That must be another turning point, you know. That, yeah, yeah. Because I think, I mean, The Exorcist is kind of it's like a reemergence of an old world fear, in a way, isn't it? It's mm. um, well, they dig it up literally. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Better, so it's gonna, yeah, yeah. But also, I mean, you get by the seventies, you've got like these real, you've got these real true American horror genres, like homegrown horror genres, and like the slasher movie and it's all its variations, uh, like the road horror movie where you've got, you know, a bunch of kids in a van or vehicle of other similar description, traveling, take a shortcut, bad idea, get lost, and then get eaten usually, yeah. you know, or some variation on that. And that, and that's, that's like, and I think something we talked about earlier that uh, what, what I find interesting about those is, uh, and I think one of the mistakes that, that filmmakers now sometimes make is this idea that physical threat is frightening like if you if you're gonna threat if you threaten someone's life or you th you know you, you threaten their limbs <laughs> or their flesh that that's the scariest thing you can do but actually it isn't really no. it the, isn't. the fear of of pain is not because it, it requires an audience to empathize with the protagonist really in order for that to work i mean i, I something like texas chain like texas chainsaw massacre and stuff like that are manifest for me, subjectively, is sort of manifest of a of loss of control. It's that thing of like you, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's the manifest of that dream I have these all the time, where it's like I have somewhere I need to get to, but I can't get out the door because I keep forgetting this, or I keep forget I can never get to where I need to get to yeah. because things keep stopping me. And it's that I suppose it's it's that sort of thing of you know central characters having to give up control. They started out they were just happy go lucky whatever on the bumbling through life not realising that they were in control or not realise or not caring and then as yeah. things get smaller and smaller it's like there's no way out. So it's something like the descent, I know we're trying to jump forward yeah, in time. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's another great sort of example of something like that where where it's not the physical violence and the threat is really is almost MacGuffin like in terms of like yeah it has a lot of veracity and absolutely a lot of verisimilitude but it's the thing you want to get away from or the thing you're trying to avoid. That's all it is, you know. So. Yeah. And that, that that thing in in Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, that yeah, they're, they're going to cut you in half with a chainsaw, and that is admittedly quite you know it's alarming. A bad day. Yeah, it could you know, sort of spoil <laughs> things a bit, but um, <laughs> but actually, like watching the film, what's really disturbing is that um, to the the chainsaw family, you're dead already, and you're just meat on legs, mm. and they do, they just it's like you're nothing, you don't matter, you have no meaning, you don't exist. No humanity. That you are like the cows that they used to clobber with the, with the hammers. Mm. And and that is that it, it's that same fear um, that you have when watching a, a zombie film and that, that idea that you could still be walking around but you're not you at all because you have been just erased, there's none yeah. of you left. And that, that idea that you've been erased and are nothing and are meaningless and that you make no mark and leave no mark on the world is like, whoa, that's that's actually quite deeply disturbing. Yes, yes. And I think that's what's really, and that's what sometimes is missing from mm. uh, horror movies that just think it's like, rah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, freaky, yeah, like, yeah, freaky, yeah. I've got a painted face, you know, <laughs> or like, you know, ah, I'm screaming, or um, stab, I'm stabbing you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah, okay. Stab, I'm stabbing you. <laughs> well, the, that's very, you know, <laughs> I know what you polite mean. version. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yeah, because then you move into more kind of, there's that fear of loss of humanity, which I think is, is prevalent and should mm. be prevalent anyway throughout most horror. There's also the kind of, once you move into the late 70s, early 80s stuff of like body horror, afraid of bodily functions, like the aliens often talked about as being a fear of mm. rape, male rape, um, or being raped, or men being afraid of childbirth, sorry, and that kind of thing, and progeny and blah, 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 and the functions of a human body and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one. Well, I, so here, I, this brings me around neatly to the thing I was going to try and talk about. This is this is an I'm on the toilet and for some reason thought of this thing um, that in regards to Hellraiser, which is what I wanted to oh, talk yeah. about with you. 
it occurred to me, <laughs> and this is puerile and ridiculous, but that the it's actually about male fear of vagina. Mm. Hear me out. <laughs> it's a box. Yeah. It's called the box, right? <laughs> yeah. Every male character fumbles with it, <laughs> can't work it, yeah. and and when they do open it, chains come out and ensnare them. Yeah, yeah. It's written yeah. and directed by a, a gay man. Yes. So his kind of idea of that, it's it's you know, from a from that perspective, put it that way. Anyway, I'm not yeah. saying it's good or bad, but it's just you know, it's from that yeah, side. Yeah. So, uh, all the women who pick the box up, by and large, um, open it instinctively. There's no, they don't, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? They, they're shown to kind of just know what they're doing with it and it doesn't <laughs> get them in the way that it does with them. The men get ripped apart and taken to hell. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, that for me kind of, and then it's kind of like the, there's there's a monastic order that come out of the, <laughs> <laughs> essentially the vagina, you know. Um, that bit, the whole monastic order, well, anyway, yeah, carry on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we are the monks of vagina. <laughs> Um, there's a big penis monster as well that comes out of it going, and oh, yeah. you know, yeah. so there's yeah, right. there's yeah. that stuff as well. Julia, the um, main bad guy, if you like, is she's she doesn't get interestingly enough, she doesn't <coughs> get killed and taken to hell at the end, but she's not. I don't think she opens the box. She doesn't have anything to do with the box. It's weird. She's sort of a casualty of I forget how she dies in that. I think she's just found on the mattress, isn't she? She's sat there. I forget. I can't remember. That's a bit of I mean, it's certainly. I mean, but, absolutely. It is about people being ensnared and ultimately possibly destroyed by their own desires right and and that idea of like transgression i'm not not by the way in relation to my early earlier thing i'm not saying that one transgression equals another or even that certain things that may be regarded as transgressions are indeed transgressions absolutely as opposed to just alternatives however um within horror i think a, a lot of the time and you saying about body horror and stuff like that it's about this idea of categories and boundaries mm. and that things that break the, those boundaries or render those bound, boundaries and categories kind of meaningless, that things get scary then. Mm. And that hell raises about basically just n not knowing when to stop and just go, just <laughs> going further and further and further and it's like you're literally like torn apart. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, it makes me think of the thing as well where like we talked with uh, Richard ages who? ago. Yeah, whoever, he, uh, <laughs> some some bloke. Anyway, um, <laughs> about the thing and the, this this idea that the thing hmm. is outside of all categories and has the potential to be anything. Yeah, and that's quite disturbing to us because we kind of think of you know species and you know types of people and d different sexes and all that sort of stuff. And when things sort of blur. It's loss of control, you know, and yeah, humanity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it's like th we we impose this this kind of like order, this structure on on the world, which yeah. may be kind of false in some respects, but we kind of need it. Mm. And when that is kind of challenged, that's when things get again get scary. Because as you say, loss of control. It's, yeah, that, it's like the thing, the same thing. It's almost like uh, fear of viruses and stuff like. Because the thing you yeah. could inhale it effectively, because it could be so small as a particle that you. There's just no way of getting away from it. And then, then later on, you've got films like Outbreak, and you know yeah. that, there was this weird glut of sudden yeah. biohazard yeah. films and that, that kind of came and went pretty quickly. But even things like Dreamcatcher, do you remember Dreamcatcher? They oh did the, 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 King, the Stephen King adaptation, but that, again, is a kind of outbreaky kind of viral thing. I don't know if that was our way of... That was That's what filled the void of zombie stuff for a while. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, zombies have got that that viral... Yeah. You know, that, you know that, that sort of viral spread. And actually, it's interesting, like, like we're talking about viral spread, it's interesting that it kind of, like, zombies become their resurrection, <laughs> um, sort of happens um, in, you know, the first decade of, of the new millennium, which is when, when the internet and specifically, like, social media is starting to happen. So the, the term viral right. and things going viral has yeah, a different... Yeah, yeah. And also people feeling like... a. a a lack of control mm. because of it mm. even though it sort of puts everything at your fingertips you're not actually touching these things <laughs> yes. at all yeah, yeah so it's like it puts a million more things at your fingertips and a million more things that you're actually not properly interacting with and you can't control yeah so i think you know but see where they've tried to and that's that's this, this is great because we've got five minutes left this is, <laughs> this is coming this is no but bringing it up to today which is great 
Firstly, in terms of the in, in the internet age, I think we are too cine literate for a start. So we watch all the behind the scenes. So we yeah. know we see behind the curtain far too much. So it's very hard for filmmakers to kind of create that element of unknown with stuff. Mm. Where they've tried to make films about social media, there's that film, I forget what it's like, Unfriended or whatever. There's a film about, mm. you know, people start dying through social media. And stuff. We're not that scared of it because we interact with these things literally every day. And I know, I know yeah. the thesis is, or oh, what if that thing you're all so familiar with started <laughs> yeah. killing you? But it's kind of like, everyone's like, eh, we're so cynical now, <laughs> I think, as a society. We don't believe a lot of what we're told. And I think that, I, I do think certain things have managed to stay outside of that. I think of things like the Babadook. That's partly a stylized thing, so that mm. it sort of works, but it's, it's sort of just, just so bizarrely unknowable sort of thing that I, and then and then and then you've got filmmakers trying to come back to what they did so Ridley Scott with Prometheus and yeah, then Covenant yeah. it's like and arguably not that successful with it I think that had a successful marketing campaign I remember seeing the trailer <laughs> for, for Prometheus and going ooh but then obviously the film wasn't I, well I didn't think it was so good yeah but um, yeah, yeah. yeah well I think I mean the thing about horror is it's never literal it's like dreams you know dreams don't just show you what you're thinking they sort of encode it in this weird way where you know you ca you can't you you have to interpret it because mm. things stand in for other things that are actually more disturbing um and so with horror there's always a metaphor there's always some metaphorical thing going on and actually it, to to make a film about social media to say social medias could, could be scary and threatening and it, to be really literal about it it's kind of like well, yeah it could you could get you could get into a sort of threatening situation through social media, but yeah, we, we kind of know that. Yeah. And actually, I, f I, I honestly feel that the zombie movies are the social media horror movies, mm. and they're nothing to do with social media. Yeah. But they're everything to do with social Absolutely, media. Yeah. They're to do with us feeling like we're just being sucked into this, this great mass of Conform. kind of brainless, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever, zombie-dom, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There's fear, I mean, like, very, very quick, I, I, uh, Two minutes? Three minutes, very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, my own experience with horror films, because, I mean, it's certainly, you know, the, in terms of um, unknown actors tend to work a lot in horror films because mm. they are the genre that typically hasn't got much budget behind it and it's mainly about concept versus selling things. I think where they've tried to make them with celebrity actors, um, Mirrors, Springs to Mind with Kiefer Sutherland, my friend Darren was in that. Shout out to Darren, who's recovering in hospital. Love you, buddy. Um, he was great in that film, and that film's not bad, but it's kind of like, I'm taken out when I'm watching Jack Bauer run around shooting at mirrors and being haunted and stuff like that. Yeah. It doesn't, it's something that I think you need that element of audience recognition in the character that a star takes you out of because you're watching a film star rather than mm. someone you don't really know. But um, I've, I did a film called uh, Wicked Witches, imaginative title, it was redone by the it was actually originally called The Witches of Dumpling Farm, and Dumpling Farm's actually here in the Cambridge. Um, anyway, but that was a, that was a film. I mean, it's it's a you know it was a, we made it for no money, but it but it's a film about kind of going away, being cavalier, shall we say, with your with your life, ending up divorced and trying to come home. It's a film about sort of trying to come home and then finding when you get home that actually home's quite a hostile place and you know you, it, it's mm. it's not what you thought and all this kind of thing so there's there's a loose allegory there um and it's against the backdrop of sort of demonic witches like hunting you down and eating your guts uh, <laughs> which is nice is nice um but it's I, 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 we didn't really touch on the kind of thr horror thriller things like um jaws and oh, um, right, yes. silence of the lambs and all that kind of stuff are put in the horror category and The Shining and stuff like that, but aren't I? Hmm, I well, the Shining the Lambs so. definitely is. Hot. It's interesting because people talk about you know, Manhunter versus mm. and talk about the two, the Hannibal Lecters, mm -mm. and it's like in a way it's unfair because like Manhunter is a thriller, yeah, but Silence of the Lambs is definitely a horror movie, okay. and you look at the the different the encounters with Lecter in each, and one is like. That it's very sort of clinical and white and mm -hmm. brightly lit, and the other one it's like this this gothic yeah. kind of crypt. Um, so it, it's definitely definitely presenting itself as horror. Mm -hmm. And Jaws, I, I, mean, I think the shark is a gigantic vagina, basically. <laughs> well, I guess I just threw that in. <laughs> I've got time to wrap up. You got twenty five seconds. Okay. On that note. Uh, shark vaginas. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe and social media is all down below. We'll see you again next time. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye. Thank you.
<laughs> Support your 7th or 8th favourite YouTube channel by buying crap, tat, junk, hogwash and filth at redbubble.com slash people slash Valverde shop.